Many of us know by now that it was the great Apostle Paul who penned this book we're looking at in January and February of 2015. Paul penned, most of us know, the great epistle to the Philippians. But what most of us don't realize would be the events that led up to Paul writing Philippians. To become aware of these events as they're narrated in Acts chapters 21 through 28 is to gain great insight into this joy-filled letter called Philippians. So that's what I'd like to do for a couple of moments is look at, in a broad way of speaking, Acts 21 through 28 so we can understand why Paul is in prison writing Philippians, and we can understand his awesome attitude that he is joyful no matter what. So these events I'm speaking about that led up to Paul and his Philippian letter actually begin on the day of Pentecost. That's what Luke tells us in Acts chapter 21. On Pentecost in 57 A.D., Paul is in Jerusalem, worshiping in the Jerusalem temple, when all of a sudden, out of the blue, come some Jews from Asia, and they attack Paul, and they start beating him with the intent of beating Paul to death. The Romans intervene, thinking that Paul is an Egyptian renegade. Once the Romans figure out who Paul is, they put Paul on trial before the Jewish Sanhedrin, or the Supreme Court of the day. Paul then gets lost in political red tape for two years as the Romans and Jews try to figure out what to do with St. Paul, this political hot potato. So they put Paul in prison in a place called Caesarea by the sea. Paul finally, in Acts chapter 26, says, I appeal to Caesar. So the Romans have no choice but to put Paul on a boat to Rome. Paul gets on this boat after a few days, Acts 27. Luke tells us there was a massive storm, a nor'easter. There were 276 people on this boat, and all of them, including Paul, thought, this is it. We are toast. We are going to sink in the bottom of the sea. They lost all hope of being saved for two weeks. Finally, miraculously, this boat, this ship is run aground on the island of Malta. And just as Paul is trying to help the people stay warm, because of course they're wet, they have just been rescued from this massive storm in the Mediterranean Sea, he's picking up some sticks to put on a fire. And what jumps out of the sticks? Acts 28 a venomous snake. Bam! Paul thinks he's going to die. He miraculously lives, wastes the winter in Malta, finally gets to Rome, Acts 28, and there Rome puts Paul under house arrest. And what does Paul do after all of that? He writes Philippians. And Paul says in our reading today from Philippians 1, that he is joyful no matter, (laughs) no matter what. Don't you need that attitude in your life today? Don't I need an attitude like that, that come hell and high water for Paul, literally, he is joyful no matter what. Well, let's get a checkup from the neck up. Let's see how we can be joyful no matter what. It all begins in our reading from Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, where Paul says, I need a perspective to live by. If I'm not going to let the snakes and the imprisonment and the perversion of justice 
and the shipwreck, if I'm not going to let that absolutely destroy me, I need a perspective to live by. Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, that what was happened to me, all of those events in Acts 21 through 28, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard to everyone else, I'm in chains for Christ. Paul, how do you stay positive in prison? Paul, how do you delight in difficulties? Paul, how are you triumphant over tragedy? Paul says, I have a perspective to live by. Perspective is a compound word. Per means through, specto, a Latin term, means spectator, right? To see. Paul says, I can see through the problem that that problem is not God's final word. You see, the problem is not the problem. The problem is how we see the problem. Let me repeat that a little bit slower so you get it. The problem is not the problem. How we see the problem, that's the problem. See, Paul wanted to go to Rome, rent the Colosseum, and preach to the masses, but God said, I've got a better plan. I'm going to put you in prison, and you are going to write Philippians, and Ephesians, and Colossians, and Philemon, the four captivity epistles. That's why Paul says, what happened to me served to advance the gospel. The gospel in Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. Paul has a perspective. He sees through the problem. He goes on and says this, as a result has become clear throughout the whole palace guard to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. Circle the word if you're taking notes. The expression, palace guard palace guard. These are the crack elite troops of the empire. These are the kingmakers of the day. In fact, the palace guard in 41 AD single-handedly took a man named Claudius and made him Caesar and king. These are the most influential people in the whole Roman empire. After they serve as palace guards, they are then given the best positions in the government. There's not a more strategic group of people that Paul could witness to. So I did the math. If Paul was under house arrest for two years in Rome, his first Roman imprisonment, there will be a second one, but his first Roman imprisonment, if he was there for two years and he got a new guard every four hours, which is the way Rome worked, then Paul witnessed to 4,380 different future leaders of the empire. You tell me who's the real prisoner. <laughs> Every time you're chained to Paul, you're going to get a four-hour sermon on how awesome and majestic is our God. As a result, history tells us that Nero, he would be the emperor of the day, that Nero didn't become a Christian, but his wife did. Several of Nero's children did. Nero's mother did because of a man named who? Paul. Uh, isn't it amazing? Uh, God puts Paul in prison, makes Nero foot the bill, and Paul gets to witness to a future Roman leader every four hours. As a result, after 200 years... The first 200 years of the Christian era, this small movement that began in Galilee now has infiltrated every social stratus in Rome. In fact, by 200 AD, 
Christianity is the dominant religion of the empire. Why is that? Because in large part to a man named Paul, he's witnessing every four hours to a future Roman leader. If I'm going to be joyful, (laughs) no matter what, I need a perspective to live by. What's Paul's perspective here in these two verses? He's saying, whatever happens, come what may, God is in charge and He's working out His purposes in my life. Philippians 1.20, so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body either by life or by death. Second point Paul makes is I need a power to live on. If I'm going to be joyful no matter what, if I'm not going to walk around looking like I've been baptized in vinegar, (laughs) I need a power to live on. Many people aren't joyful because they're so tired all the time. Some of us feel like we're Charles Atlas. We have to hold up the entire world. We're weary, we're exhausted, we're defeated. I recently saw this caption, there's this mother standing at the open door of her home. She was frazzled. She looked like she hadn't gotten an hour's sleep in three weeks. She was holding a crying baby. Two small children were grabbing onto our legs. A cat, a cat was chasing a dog and the dog was barking. It was just pandemonium and chaos. And there at the open door of her house is a pole taker. And he simply asks, what do you mean? You're undecided. All I asked was, do you live here? (laughs) You ever feel like you just want to cut and run? Get out of Dodge? Uh, Go to South Florida and begin a whole new identity and life? Why is that? Because we're just sick and tired of being sick and tired. We need a power to live on. Uh, Look what Paul says. I know that through your prayers, he's talking to the Philippians, and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Paul's not going to give up. Oh, no way. Paul doesn't have quit in his vocabulary because he has a power to live on, and that power comes by the what? The Spirit of Jesus Christ. Jesus explains the Spirit's power in Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The Holy Spirit gives us power to be joyful no matter what because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. And the Spirit points us to the gifts given by Jesus, the gifts of the gospel, clean conscience, new start, the gifts of holy baptism, I am born again, the gifts of the Holy Supper, real body and real blood for a real, new, powerful, joyful life. You want to be joyful no matter what, even if you're collecting some sticks and a snake jumps out, bam. (laughs) You need a power to live on. And that power is ours freely by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul goes on. He says, we also need a purpose to live for. If you don't have a lasting purpose, you're not going to be very joyful in life, right? Paul says, I need a purpose to live for. Now, when he sits down and writes Philippians, he's he's an old man. He's 63 years old. Now, back in the day, 63 was like 103. Well, life expectancy was about 37. 
Paul's 63. He's old. He's tired. He's in prison. He's been in prison now for about four years. Rome has taken away his dignity, his freedom. Rome has tried to take everything away from Paul. But Rome can't take away Paul's purpose for living. What's your purpose for living? Well, maybe try this. For me to live, bottom line, is money. That's right, money. That's why I get up every day, money. And to die, leave it all behind. For me to live is fame. Fame, that's it, fame. I want to be known. For me to live is fame. And to die is to be quickly forgotten. If you're like me, for me to live is control. Control, that's why I want to control things. And to die is to lose it all. No wonder so many people are negative and sad. They don't have a purpose really worth living for. Those purposes are shallow. They don't have any substance. Paul says here is a purpose that gives you joy no matter what. As I told the children, this is the ultimate win-win. For me to live is Christ. And to die, guess what? Because of his shed blood, that is gain. Try that one out. See how that works. What an awesome purpose to live for. There was this middle-aged man from West Virginia. He'd never been to any big city, much less the Big Apple, New York. But Paul, as he was called, decided when his son Junior turned 16, he was going to take Ma and Junior to where? The Big Apple, Lower Manhattan. Here they come. As they drove up to this 26-star hotel, Paul got a little jittery. He told Ma, Ma, you stay in the pickup. While Junior and I go into the hotel and kind of scout things out, as Junior and Pa were in this plush hotel, they started hearing something in the background. Click, click, click. They had never seen anything like this. It was a magical room where the doors opened from the middle. Just then, this wrinkled, haggard, old lady shuffled up, pushed the button, click, the doors open. She walked in, pushed another button, click, the doors closed. 20 seconds later, Pa Jr. heard another click. The doors open. Out walked this fabulously looking blonde. Pa had an idea. <laughs> quick, Jr., Go get Ma! (laughs) Seems like everybody's looking for that room, right? Yeah, let's be honest. Everyone's looking for a magical room like that. Where, click, I have the perfect marriage. Click, I've got the perfect church, the perfect health. I've got the perfect children. What's the little room you are looking for today where you think, if I can just get that, I will finally and fully be happy? Read my lips. You will never find a room like that, not on planet Earth. Trust me on this. I'm your pastor. I would not let you down. You will never, ever, ever in this life find a room like that. In fact, the source of your greatest sadness and oppression and brokenness is your pursuit of a room just like that. So how is Paul finally wrapping all this up? This is the truth of the day. This is what Paul is saying in the middle part of Philippians 1. Pain, 
pain. Oh, my. Deep running pain. That is inevitable. Just ask Paul. Misery, misery is what? Misery is optional. Just ask Paul. All of us live in pain. Some of you live in deep running torment. But that's not the end of the story. If pain is inevitable, misery, that's what? That's optional. Paul was given great gifts. Paul was given a perspective. Paul was given power. And Paul had a purpose. And those gifts are yours too. In the name of Jesus, today, here, right now, in this place. Why is that? (laughs) So like Paul, we are joyful no matter what.